I would like to invite up our two experts who are going to speak from the federal landscape about working waterfronts. I'll let you decide which one you want. Okay, uh, I have Jeff Gabriel. Jeff Gabriel is from the National Marine Manufacturers Association and he's on the steering committee for the National Working Waterfront Network. He's legislative counsel for the National Marine Manufacturers Association, the nation's leading recreational marine industry trade association. Over the course of Jeff's career, he's, he's worked at a high capacity on Capitol Hill as well as in the private sector. He's worked as close advisor to former, former Senator Arlen Specter in the mid-90s and as legislative director for Congressman Chris Carney from Pennsylvania. Jeff's combination of experiences has provided him with knowledge of the many issues facing both the business community as well as federal policymakers. Jeff has a BA from, in political science from LaSalle and a master's in international affairs from George Washington and a JD from George Mason University and is a member of the District of, Bar of, Columbia, uh, the District of Columbia Bar. Kyle Moulton. Kyle Moulton is the field representative for Senator Shelley Pingree of Maine. Shelley Pingree was the first person to introduce a National Working Waterfront Act legislation and Kyle has been working with her on that pretty much the whole time and uh, others in the room also have worked on that. You'll hear more about it. He's a field rep and he located in Portland, Maine. Kyle closely wor works closely with the Maine coastal communities, particularly on issues surrounding the working waterfronts, fisheries, agriculture, conservation, and environmental regulations. He previously worked on legislative issues in Washington, D.C. while serving as a, a CNAS Marine Policy Fellow, including work on the Keep America's Waterfront, Working Waterfront Act, which is the bill that Shelley had introduced, of 2011. And it was introduced into the 112th Congress. Kyle studied marine science and fisheries at the University of Maine and holds a master's degree in fisheries and wildlife from Michigan State University. He studied and worked on natural resource issues in the Gulf of Mexico, the Great Lakes, Pacific Northwest, and of course his native state of Maine. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, that's, uh, all that stuff was all a lie. Here's the most important thing about me. I got in the elevator the other day and somebody looked at me and said, dang, you look like a prized cow that just came back from the fair. So. <laughs> That's about right. Um, all right, we're almost done. We're getting close. And we've got a little bit of work to do this afternoon or, this, uh, or later this morning. But just, and I, I always hate when people say, close your eyes and think about something. But, you know, calm yourself down. Take a breath for a second, you know. Think about, like, uh, the most evil place in the world you can think of, right? What, what you, I mean, just for a second. I'll think about it. What are you thinking about, right? There's centipedes running across the floor, you know. There are cockroaches everywhere. There are vampires and zombies, you know. And there's slimy lawyers behind every lamppost, you know. That's D.C., right? <laughs> nah, it's worse. <laughs> so... With that, the national political landscape, perhaps we should be calling it the political seascape. So, you know, what is the political seascape in Washington, D.C., and why do we care about it? Uh, look, not to insult your intelligence, but, you know, what we've been talking about for the past two days could be addressed some, in some instances from a federal level. And, in fact, uh, and I wasn't at it, but the last uh, symposium, that was one of the goals that came out of the symposium was, you know, we're going to be working collectively together, and a lot of us probably still feel that way on national legislation to, to really fix some of our problems. But, you know, a quick reflection of the state of our national politics might give us pause right now. Um, at the very least, a good understanding of the political climate in D.C. helps us when we start to think about our pri priorities as we go into the marketplace of solutions to our problems. Um, the past couple of days have been very fruitful. We've, had, we've identified a lot of issues. We, we've dissected a lot of issues. We've actually had some significantly substantive conversations about solutions to some of our problems. Okay, so what does the seascape look like, Jeff? 
Uh, unless you've been living under a rock for the past few years, I dare say you are quite well aware that there's a tremendous amount of dysfunction in Washington, D.C. these days. Sequestration, anybody? Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that Congress has literally, in many respects, lost the ability to sort of help the country work on even some of our simplest problems. And in the very recent past, we've gotten to the point now where Congress is actually self-inflicting problems on itself and on us, the people who sent them there. Why? Uh, you've probably heard a lot of pundits talk about this, if you read about it, and a bit of a political junkie. And, uh, you know, these are just some of my observations. I'm, I'm really no expert, and I'm no better than a lot of the folks that I've met in the past couple of days. You, you know, this is a very bright crowd, and, and you guys are pretty politically attuned. But, uh, so these are my ideas. Uh, some pundits feel this way, some would disagree with me. But, you know, I'll leave it up to you to think about what, you know, why are we having such a problem in Washington, D.C., and why are we having a difficulty addressing some real substantive problems? Well, we have a divided government, all right? President Obama is a Democrat. Um, he's a great orator, but even some of my Democratic friends who are very, very dyed-in-the-wool Democrats will tell you that he is not technically a, a very good governor, a governor in the sense of somebody that understands how to run the government. Now, there's reasons for that, and he's told the people, I came to Washington to change it. Always be very cautious when you hear a politician who wants to go to Washington telling you he's going to change Washington. One of two things is going to happen. He's going to be completely co-opted by Washington, in my opinion, and that actually may be beneficial to you because he might be able to get some stuff done for you, certainly under the old days, or you're going to have a situation where you really start to grind the gears of government trying to run against something that was put in place by the founding fathers and quite frankly not put together to work smoothly. Um, the government was not designed to necessarily work smoothly at the federal level. It was designed to slowly plod along and listen to the people, the representative, the, the folks that they represent of what it is we should be doing as a nation. Okay, so President Obama's a Democrat. The Congress is divided itself, and the House of Representatives is Republican, and the Senate is Democrat. That, in many respects, because the fact that the House is the only body in Washington, D.C. right now controlled by the Republicans, is what gives us the divided government. But remember, things weren't that better, and I was in Congressman Carney's office when the Senate was Democrat, President Obama was a Democrat, and the House was a Democrat. Uh, there was a little bit of a different problem then, but it wasn't that much of a difference because of the fight, typically, the way that the founding fathers set it up between Congress and the president. Within the House Republican majority, the Republican majority is divided between the old establishment Republicans who are, by and large, astute governors and the new Tea Party folks, and I'm not denigrating anybody in here who's a Tea Partier at all, but the new folks that have come in, Republicans from across the country, particularly House members, who really want to disassemble Washington, D.C. They really have a philosophy that government really doesn't do any good, and it should be devolved down to the states and from the states to the local levels, and quite frankly, if we can get the power back to the people, great. The danger in that is, and I've heard some of the conversations, I say, well, okay, what about the interstate highway system? That's not our problem. That's not the federal government's problem. And I scratch my head and go, I think it is. But that's kind of the mentality within the House GOP. So that really sets up a very difficult situation for uh, Speaker John Boehner. And by dint, we have, uh, we have a ground the gears of, of legislation in Washington pretty much to a halt. Major topic in D.C. and around the country are fiscal problems. Um, we, we, have, we do have a deficit and a debt problem, but it depends on who you listen to and to how great that problem is and how fast we need to fix it. And that is a real debate to have. Trade deficits are others, but, and then spending cuts and tax increases and all of that kind of fits in. And that's kind of what Washington itself is focused on constantly for the past couple of years, debt deficit cut taxing, no, I don't want to tax you, you know, this, that, everything, while 
dams are cracking, bridges are falling in up in Minneapolis uh, several years ago when the I-35 bridge fell into the Missis uh, Mississippi River up there in Minnesota and killed people. And, you know, these are real problems that are just sitting there and it doesn't look like the infrastructure is falling apart. You'd go over that bridge every day, but when the I-35 falls in, you get a problem. Um, so, anyway, these are the kinds of things that are going on and we're not addressing them because we're focused on these other things that are important, but you know, you add that to, the, to the, the, the divided government, we have a real problem. But that's not really a satisfying answer to why we haven't been able to get things done because frankly folks, like I said before, the Constitution set this up, this has been like this for years. Many folks who are older than I am, you know, were around during the Carter years and, and, and the Nixon years and when we had divided government, we had fights then too, but we got things done. So, all right, what were the old days like? Well, in the old days, at least from my experience, you know, there, there, were, there was always ideologues, you know? But the adults had control of the playground. Uh, you know, former Senator Alan Simpson from Wyoming, who's kind of famous now for the simpson Bowles idea for deficit uh, reduction and, and taking care of our fiscal house, uh, was a senator at the time when I was in Senator Specter's office, and I used to sit on the floor and I would take notes. That was my job, my first job uh, for the senator uh, on all the debates. So I got to see these guys literally like I'm looking at you guys, uh, which was fascinating for four or five years until I just burnt out. But uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, many know Senator Ted Kennedy uh, or the name, um, w these two folks could not have been more ideologically opposed, not even close. They loved each other. They were, they were some of the best friends in the world. And they would get on the floor of the Senate on a Thursday afternoon when nothing was going on and nobody was paying attention and they would argue for two hours over abortion, over cattle rights on public land and they'd have charts and they'd be showing this stream was better with the cattle than it was before and Ted Kennedy would be going, it would not be, you know. And, they'd, and I mean, it was crazy. Then they loved each other, they'd go have a drink, they'd come back the next week, uh, welfare reform would be on the floor. They'd argue and fight over a half percent of that bill and agree to everything else, let it go through. President Clinton signed it, working with Newt Gingrich. And we get welfare reform that former Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, no shrinking violet in the liberal progressive movement, said this is probably very good for the country. And it was. So in the old days we worked and the adults worked and we address situations and we fix them. Today, it's Lord of the Flies minus the exotic tropical location. <laughs> or a better way to put it is, the adults have lost control of the playground and some of the kitties are real scary. So, okay, here's my sense of why Washington is also presently so dysfunctional. I think it starts to get a little bit deeper into why you know, sociologically, we're at the spot that we're at right now in, in, the, in the federal government. The GOP's divided. And I think um, you can, and again, some of the folks who are just slightly older than I am, because I'm getting up there, um, can remember when the Democratic Party before President Clinton came in, using the uh, progressive uh, uh, think tanks and really sort of picked the Democratic Party that was demoralized and divided in many different fractions, factions and pulled it together and really gave it a purpose. Uh, that's kind of where the Republicans are right now. And so we're in that bit of a molass, like we were kind of, well, it's a little wor worse now uh, for a good reason, and I'll get to it in a second, than we were during those Carter years. I remember the Carter malaise. Um, we have very few moderates of either party left on the Hill, and they are marked for death by the parties. I mean, that is just, that's, I mean, I, that's who I worked for. I'm a Republican moderate. They call me a rhino, Republican in name only, right? Uh, because I happen to think that uh, we, the government has a responsibility to public infrastructure, right? I mean, I, I'm fully in the Republican camp on the abortion issue and all kinds of things, and those are personal issues, and they have national debates and all that stuff. So we can argue about that. But we shouldn't be arguing about the things that government does good strong defense to protect us. Protect our trade representative, our, our trade 
across the, with, with nations across. Make sure we keep them fair when we're doing stuff. Make sure markets are open. Make sure our food is safe. Make sure we can get our goods to the marketplace. Those are things that government should do, and I don't personally happen to believe that uh, we can do that without a fairly strong, robust local, state, and federal government, and so I'm a Republican in name only. Um, we've inherited a fiscal mess that predates the Great Recession. Now, the Great Recession made it explode, uh, but we predated it. And the, the, the reason, in my opinion, that the GOP is divided right now is because the establishment, under former Speaker Denny Hastert, who I know, and Tom DeLay, who I've met, um, they, you know, they talked out of one side of their mouth and spent money like a drunken sailor out of their other pocket. And so the, the new Republicans look at them and they want to they want to take them out too. Um, and so we do have a mess and we do have to address it. And, it. and it will cause us as a nation to be thoughtful and think about how we're going to address this from a series of tax increases, which we did already have, and I'm sorry to the Republican, my friends that are out there, we had one just recently, to cuts that we're seeing and we saw prior to sequestration or sequester. There's a big argument, by the way, from a real, pol you want to be real smart when you go home, tell people, ask them, find out of yourself, because I don't even know. What's the real noun? Is it sequester or sequestration? Believe it or not, there's like this little debate going on in, in the you know beltway from the from the uh, journalist. Well, I, what is the true noun of this? You know, well, anyway, are, have you been sequestered or is it sequestration? I don't. know. Um, there's been a steady erosion of the old regular order. We don't have earmarks anymore. Great, no more earmarks. Really? I mean, I I I, I question that, and I question that because. If you go back and you take a look at the Constitution, the last I looked, the Congress was the one that had the power of the purse, not the president. It was set up that way. They don't want the president to sit there as a king to be able to do everything. They had to go back to the, the people's representatives to actually spend the money. That's their prerogative. The first sets of appropriations bills in the 1700s were all about lighthouses for all of us that do working waterfront. Go back and look at it. It's only 60 pages, so it wasn't that big. And it was all earmarks. Put this lighthouse up in Maine on this point, do this, do that, do the other thing. That's what it was. Okay, so can it be abused and was it abused, the earmarks? Hell yes. But we have a responsibility to hold them responsible, not to tell them they shouldn't be doing it. At any rate, earmarks were the grease that helped things like highway bills get done. Things like water resource development acts get done. Because I'm sorry, people, the Founding Fathers understood what we are as human beings. We're selfish. We care about our interests, not yours. I want mine. Well, I'll take care of yours, but you have to take care of mine. Okay. And that's the tension that's been put in there. And that's how we've been able to build a country that's the size of a continent and become the greatest economy and the greatest country this nation, this, this world's ever known. Benevolent, too, I might add. Uh, there's been a steady erosion of the, of the earmarks, the freshman revolts. That's rel relatively new and unheard of in history, that freshmen would get elected to the House and turn around to the party leaders and bite them in the hand. That's, that's unusual. And so that really starts to, Speaker Boehner, what is he supposed to do when his freshmen, which is a big majority of his, of his people, are biting him in the hand and he can't get anything done? And here's my biggest one. We have a 24-hour news service that has to fill all that space, and it's become very fragmented with the types of new social media we have. So, you're a liberal, you listen to Rachel Maddow. You're a conservative, you listen to Rush Limbaugh or any of the nutcases on Fox News. And all you hear from those people day in and day out is, we lost the election as Republicans because we weren't conservative enough. Are you kidding me? You weren't conservative enough. Todd Egan was saying that if a female gets raped, she probably doesn't really get pregnant. How much farther to the right do you want to go? You're going to lose election after election after election. And the party establishment did an autopsy of this and said, we got to change our strategy, folks. We got to take a look at what we do as a party if we want to ever be, you know, get back into the game here in the near future. So, and believe me, I have problems with my, the, my Democratic liberal friends on the left. I won't even get into that because if you think that was loud, you should hear what I have to say about them. 
Okay, I painted a rosy picture here. Nicole, let's shed some tears and go have some beers. Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. There are some silver linings, uh, and there are some opportunities for us to move some, to move some positive legislation and some bills and take care of some of our issues that we care about. The states are where the game is right now, in my, my opinion. And some of what Washington is trying to do is to send some of the power back down to the states, whether they're doing it consciously or unconsciously, that's what's happening. I have a good example for you guys. Some of our friends up in the uh, Maine Aquaculture Association and the commercial fishermen and the lobstermen up there got themselves together and worked wicked hard to fix the way tax property was taxed, and among other things, in Maine, for the commercial fishermen and the lobster, and quite literally probably saved lives. They certainly saved jobs. They certainly protected working waterfronts up there, but they probably quite literally saved lives up there. So there is good opportunity for us to get down into the local level, down into the states, and into the weeds, and take care of, of our situation. But even in Congress, and I'm almost finished, um, even in Congress, we've got, we can still get some things done. Last Congress, we got a, a paltry highway bill done. Um, we've, we do work still in a non-regular order way to try to address bills like uh, Kyle's uh, boss, and he's going to talk about this in a second. And it's a process by which we have to keep the debate going on the federal level, do the best that we can to grease the wheels and at some point in time when it's appropriate, and that's the art form, I think Kyle will say it, the, at the appropriate time, tuck it onto something that's got to go through. It's like sticking a, you know, a rail car on the back of a train that's just about to leave the station that has to leave the station. And if, if you're lucky and you're good and you've got to work hard at it for years, you can stick your car on there at some point in time and, you know, and it'll take off. And we might be able to get pieces of things done that we kind of would all agree on. Doesn't fix everything, but fixes some of it. Um, I think with that, the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, on a federal level, if we're going to continue to focus on that as a group, uh, it's good to do so because I think if you, even if you're just having the debate, even if Chili Pingree is still up there, God love her, fighting the good fight on national legislation that we care about, trying to put up, it's a, it's a, it's a prominent position. It's a national audience. It puts national context to the issue. It draws attention and it helps empower our state and local representatives to connect themselves and say, if they can't do it, but they've identified some pretty cool solutions, we can on the state level. Let's try it at our level first. And that is what I think you're seeing across the country that's, you know, governors and state legislators are doing some kind of unique things on a, on a whole host of issues. And I think with that, we'll hear what Kyle has to say uh, from Jelly Pingree's office standpoint. Thanks, Jeff, for that, and thank you all for uh, being here today. I, I know a lot of you have been here a lot longer than I have. I was only here yesterday and still heard some really good conversations, but I imagine everybody in this room are the real go-getters, so this is where it really happens. Um, um, first of all, I would really like to, again, just thank the folks um, who put the symposium together. This has been really helpful um, for me as a congressional staffer just to see um, folks from around the country um, talking about these issues and see what the energy is in the room. Um, I really wanted to start by uh, sort of highlighting uh, a few points. Um, first of all, I'm sure some of you have heard that, that uh, my boss, uh, Shelly Pingree, um, who represents the sort of southwestern coast of Maine, um, from Penobscot Bay down to the New Hampshire border and inland a little bit, and then the entire rest of the state is one other district, so I've only got two. Um, but uh, she was one of the first people to really ask for the development of a uh, National Working Waterfronts Network um, at the last symposium. And I think uh, I could say on her behalf that she'd probably be really proud of what that group has, has done, and some of the, the work that, that's happened there is really helped bring working waterfront issues to sort of to the forefront, build those conversations and build that expertise um, that we're going to really rely on to actually get something done in Washington. Um, so after that, I really just wanted to highlight um, a couple of points. The uh, first thing I wanted to do was outline what um, my boss's bill actually was for those that maybe aren't um, familiar with it last, uh, when it was introduced last session. 
um, and talk a little bit about what sort of the next steps are there. And then I wanted to just give you guys um, a little bit of perspective um, from somebody who's worked in DC, who works on the ground in the district for a member of Congress who really cares about these issues um, and what's helpful to hear from you guys so that we can do a better job um, representing um, the folks uh, that we represent. Um, going from there, um, I would say uh, our bill um, last session it was introduced, I think, in October of 2011, um, before I was actually with uh, the Congresswoman's office. Um, but it was called the, the Keep America's Waterfronts Working Act, and I think uh, that's a title that everybody in this room can probably get around um, conceptually. And I think in order to sort of describe what the intent of this bill was, um, I think somebody earlier, and I forget who it was, but in one of the presentations, um, somebody mentioned that only 15% of the funding um, to work on working waterfronts issues is, comes from federal sources and it's not directed. And so the intent of this bill was really focused on that problem. So could we take that 15% and turn it into 30%, 40% and actually target it for that specific group? And, and how it would have done that had it been adopted in the last Congress, which it wasn't, um, was to amend the Coastal Zone Management Act and create a grant program uh, administered through NOAA um, that would have provided um, grants to states with working waterfront plans. And so those um, working waterfront plans, uh, as described in the legislation, would have been handled by the states, um, but they would have outlined how those states intended to preserve and expand um, access for folks um, that work, you know, on a lot of the same things that you guys do in this room, commercial and recreational fishing, aquaculture, boat building and other uh, marine uh, waterfront dependent um, businesses. And of course, you're probably going to ask, I've already sort of alluded to it a little bit here, but how'd that go? <laughs> um, well, uh, we had a, a really good start. We got 22 co-sponsors um, on board. Unfortunately, in the House of Representatives, all of them were Democrats. And that doesn't necessarily um, go too far, especially after we heard some of uh, Jeff's comments, um, that's not necessarily um, the crowd that we need to get an audience with. Um, and just for example, so folks know, um, that went to the Natural Resources Committee um, for conversations there about the bill. Um, and uh, you know, that's a, there's definitely folks on that committee who care about this issue, um, but there's also folks who have other priorities. Um, and the jurisdiction of that committee is pretty broad, so. Um, it can be a challenge there as well. That being said, that the legislation didn't move um, despite, you know, good support among a, a cohort I would call of sort of the usual suspects on these sorts of things. Um, it really was a good uh, rallying point for a lot of folks, I think, in this room to talk about this issue and give it a broader federal perspective. Um, when a lot of the work that actually happens, as Jeff outlined, happens, and I'm sure you guys are working on all these individual projects, happen at the local or state <laughs> level. Um, and it really, like I said, those conversations, going back to the points um, raised earlier about conversations um, and communication, are really one of the biggest things. So now that you know a little bit about what we did um, last session, I will tell you that uh, Congresswoman Pingree is, is very interested in continuing to carry the torch and uh, fight the good fight there. So you'll likely see um, in the next couple of months us reintroducing a bill um, that's very similar to, to the previous version, probably with some adaptations. I've definitely been uh, trying to keep my ears open and take good notes um, here at this uh, symposium because I think there's some amazing ideas out here. Um, and I'm not an ideas uh, guy. I just try to institute some of the great ideas that I hear. So which is a point I'll get to um, in a minute. Um, so from a perspective of somebody who works on a congressional staff, I think a lot of folks in the room maybe have some experience working with their member of Congress or their staff. Um, but it's a little different, I guess, sometimes when you're actually inside the room, um, you 
know, trying to figure out what these pieces of legislation will look like, getting on the phone, talking strategy, communicating with folks in the agency. And so you guys might ask, well, what is helpful for me? What, and I guess what I, I my sort of issue here is there's, there's ways that you guys can be really helpful to us. Um, and I really wanted to highlight a point that Senator Murray um, outlined yesterday. Members of Congress work for you guys. And as dysfunctional as Congress can be, and sort of has been the last few years, uh, I shouldn't say sort of, um, you know, it, in some ways it is a reflection of what they're hearing from their constituencies. Um, you guys really have an important role in making sure that the conversations in Washington reflect what's actually going on in those districts. And oftentimes the squeaky wheel, the loudest voice, is what folks respond to, unfortunate, unfortunately. Um, and I would also outline um, a point that more folks than would probably like to admit it, um, who work for, for members of Congress or senators, um, are gonna, would tell you perhaps over a beer <laughs> that their day um, and what their topic of conversation is in their office in a given day is probably more tied to uh, an article in the local newspaper that their boss um, reads flying somewhere. Um, you know, for example, uh, you might uh, read in the local paper that uh, a local farm's, you know, uh, barn burned down. And next thing you know, the phone rings and it's your boss. And they say, well, you're my expert on farms. What are we gonna do about this barn? And so I guess the point to you guys is you need to tell us that the barn burned down. Um, and a reflection, I guess a second point from that is that I guess I, w I was introduced as supposedly expert and what I, the, perhaps the most important thing I want to get across to you guys is that I'm no expert. You guys are really the experts and people like me who work on these issues in DC rely on you to get us the information to be the experts so that we can cite those, those numbers, those stories and it's really critical um, that the folks in this room have, you know, understand that we can't do our jobs alone. And that's a really important point, and I just, you know, especially for those who maybe haven't worked in D.C. or haven't trudged the halls, I guess I'm not asking everyone here to, to go to D.C. and knock down my door and ask, you know, for a specific thing. That's Jeff's job, and there's a few folks here that I know that's their job, and that's not all your jobs. But you can start small, and I think Part of that is having conversations with folks like me when we happen to attend something like this or we're at an event. Catch us on the side and say, hey, you know, we're working on this really important project and we just want you guys to know about it. Um, reach out to us, share those articles, those newspaper, uh, you know, clip something out and, and send it to us and, and let us know that there's a problem in your community or else we can't um, even get started, you know. We can't get the ball rolling without um, knowing that there's an issue that needs work. Um, I think I had some other points here, but that was really the, the big take home. Um, I did want to outline just a few things that I've heard um, that were really exciting um, from a congressional staffer perspective because they're things I feel like Congress should be able to work on. And these are just some things I pulled out of the toolkit summary um, that was uh, presented earlier. And I starred three big items. Um, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a little bit here, but uh, one was to uh, recognize the importance of working waterfronts at the highest levels of government. Okay, we can do that, maybe, let's see, we'll try. Recognize the inability of local communities to address large scale national level drivers of change. All right, we can probably recognize that sort of thing. And establish working waterfronts as a priority national goal, ensure coordination between federal agencies. Well, we often pick up the phone with federal agencies and try to get them to talk to each other, so that might not be too much of a problem. Um, but I wanted to sort of outline why those three things were relevant to me. 
they're definitely important issues. They're very important issues to outline and make sure that we move forward on. There are definitely things that Congress should and could be tackling, and they're definitely not going to happen unless you guys actually make us work on them. And so on that note, I would say, you know, you guys really need to make the push. And I think perhaps most importantly, even if we were to work on these without your guys' input, you probably wouldn't want us to do that because we'd probably find ourselves down the wrong rabbit hole. Um, and with that, I think uh, I would just encourage you um, to have those conversations, to become acquainted with the staff in your district, um, with your member of Congress, and see them as a resource for you. There's ways that we can be helpful even if we can't move um, larger level um, legislation, um, but we do want to have that conversation. So thank you all for being here today. We have maybe a minute or two. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask for the speakers? Uh, let's see, do we have a mic? Uh, somebody get out, uh, run a mic back. Thank you. Uh, both, both of you gave very interesting presentations. Specifically for Kyle, um, you mentioned that uh, Congresswoman Pingree's bill uh, took the path of the Natural Resources Committee, yet you'd also describe that committee as not having an ideal makeup for, uh, you know, consideration and moving it along. Is there a better path for this next bill to consider that might have uh, uh, provide a better political chance? Well, I think that's an, an excellent question. Um, one of the things that folks, um, you know, both advocates in D.C. And, and staffers really, one of our biggest challenges if we're trying to move a piece of legislation is to really look at the makeup of those committees and see if there's alliances that could be forged in those committees. Um, and there is, I guess it's no secret that if you know a chairman of a committee um, is an ally on that issue, that you're going to have a much more, a, a much easier time, um, at least getting an audience and perhaps moving forward. That being said, um, I, and something I, I probably should have outlined a little bit is, you know, our bill only took one possible approach, and and one of the things that I've heard in this room is different ideas, um, and maybe it's not a comprehensive um, issue that, that is the way to tackle some of those more specific issues, but there's definitely other approaches that could um, perhaps approach other committees. Um, Jeff could also probably speak to some of the, the other committees that would be useful. Well, you know, I, I would say this, without sitting down and actually, that's a, that is that is the question I think Kyle would admit um, when you're writing the bill. Uh, the answer, and it's not satisfying right now, but the answer to your question to get you on the right track is when a bill is drafted like that and it goes down to ledge council, I mean this is in the weeds, basically this is what you're asking, believe it or not. Uh, it, it, ledge council is going to be the one that determines what committee of jurisdiction that bill's supposed to go to. So depending on how that bill is written, you know, a, a real crafty legislator is thinking of how he's going to draft the bill to get it into this committee versus this committee versus this committee. And so, like Kyle said, in this next iteration, uh, we, we may find ourselves hand-tied and back at the same committee. We may be able to draft it in a way that sort of uh, can get it into a more favorable committee. Uh, but the larger point, and, and Kyle really uh, did, I mean, an excellent job and, and is absolutely spot on, and that is those of us in the room that can advocate, and I know there are those in the room that can't, um, but those of us in the room that can advocate and that really care about this and will continue to work together as part of the Working Waterfronts Network need to look at the list of the members on the both Republican and Democratic side and any committee that that bill gets to and maybe already pre-massage some of those folks and get them into the front of the line before the bill is even 
completely, the ink is dry on it in some respects, so that you already have an audience when the bill lands in that particular committee's jurisdiction. We have time for one more question over here. Thank you. My, my uh, question is more of a comment for Kyle. It was very interesting when you said that uh, you have to tell us the barn is burning down. And speaking from uh, an industrial working waterfront perspective, the barn's not burning down on the West Coast. Uh, we don't have, uh, as I see it, and we'll talk more about this in the next session, but we don't have any pressing legislative issues that need to be addressed. We have regulatory issues, pre prescriptive regulatory problems, but that's really an executive problem. Um, so it's very difficult. It's always been very difficult for us who are advocating on behalf of this industry to kind of get something that we need from you. Um, my second comment is that you said that the 22 co-sponsors of your bill, your National Working Waterfront bill, were Democrats. You couldn't get any Republicans. Well, I look at a, the West Coast, and the first waterfront Republican that we have from Bellingham all the way down is in Orange County. So um, that makes sense to me that they would be Democrats because the Democrats represent the working waterfront on the West Coast. However, at least on the industrial side, I would say most of those involved in working on the waterfront and the commercial fishing and, and maritime industries would tend to be Republicans. They're small, independent business owners. So there's another dichotomy there that, that would really need to be addressed. Definitely. I think those are, those are really good comments. And I would say that uh, perhaps if the barn isn't burning, it's maybe smoldering. And so, um, you know, sometimes uh, a little more proactive uh, work on some of these issues is really what needs to happen. And, and it's always easier to put out the fire when it's just a you know, smoldering pile of hay than when it's a fully engulfed barn. So um, just to stick with the analogy. But, um, and, I think I, and I think what you're talking about speaks really to, to some of the regional issues here that are embedded in this national conversation in that you know, there are places where the working waterfronts issue regionally the barn is already burning, you know, and that's one of the things we saw in the Northeast um, and the, the things that happened in the, the state of Maine were because there were some folks that were literally on the edge of losing um, their businesses, losing access to, to the waterfront. Um, and so the, the coalition that, that was put together there was really able, again, just staying with the example, to really take that message um, to their legislators at a state level, and obviously it was heard at a federal level as well. So even though some of those regulatory and e executive type changes um, maybe aren't a fully engulfed barn, there's definitely, it's worth having that conversation, so. No, I, I fully agree with Kyle. I mean, that's perfectly stated. Okay, we're gonna make a transition now to the plenary panel.